Now you're going to listen to Sergeant. He's going to talk about IoT security and give you an overview of protocols. Enjoy. Hi. Uh, my name is Sergeant, and I will talk a little bit about IoT security. Uh, I attended this presentation uh, to be noob friendly. So I'm really uh, interesting if all of you are heard about uh, Bluetooth, Zigbee, and stuff like that. Uh, can you raise your hands, Zigbee people? Okay, SDR people. Okay, Wireshark all. Well, I'm good. I'm good. I, I, uh, I, I was. I was. I was <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, I will. I have a little bit to hang over from last day. It, it was really great. And let's talk about a little bit about me. I'm Sergej Radojčić. Uh, I'm BSc in Geomatics, ma a Master of Mechatronics. I work for Novelic IC uh, in Belgrade. I work on Zigbee development of, of Gateway. Uh, I'm not security expert, and this is not this is okay. This is not intended for security guys. I more likely intended this presentation for developers who need to know about security and implementation of protocols. I'm Ham Radio uh, with Alexander Bokalov, he's a great guy. I just got my last, first, uh, first order license, uh, yeah, and I need, I, I know, I can, uh, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm a member of Maker Community in Noisad. We are not hackers, we are makers. So one of the guys, Jan, is here. I am glad he's here, he, he could make it. Uh, okay, I have IT background uh, in LoRa, Zigbee, Bluetooth, Low Energy, RFID. I'm also a Linux developer, so uh, enough about me. Okay, first thing, uh, lock is, uh, we are changing lock into radio signals. That's the fact. In maybe 10 or 15 years, I don't think we'll have keys, like keys, keys. And when this change occur, we need to develop. So we usually hacked locks with lock picks, but what, with what will we hack other things? So uh, the problem with this is that people are making really quick, uh, with Arduino and Raspberry Pi, really quick prototypes. And this is the problem now because, you know, if you do LED diode plus Arduino plus uh, uh, some kind of C module, you're not IT developer, you're just kid with Arduino. And this is a bad thing because security really, really suffers in this field because we have low cost and we, when we have low cost, we need to make some compromises. So you're not developer. Uh, so this is not important. I want to talk about a little bit about SDR. Uh, what is SDR? It's, uh, it's intended because software is cheap. It's not, but uh, when you make hardware, software is cheap because when you make 10,000 of devices, software, is, software cost is zero, hardware cost is a lot. So there were more software, cheaper hardware and people are developing software-defined radios now because you can implement a lot of things with fewer cost. The main thing about uh, software development, uh, so SDR, is front-end, which in initially only do, which initially only do uh, digital, uh, analog signal transfer into digital signal. So this is one. This is this is block shim of uh, front end. Uh, basically, I don't know why. Okay, color is good. It's not good in there. Uh, basically, the red one. Do you see the red thing? There are no colors on there. I'm sorry. Uh, RF front end is RF filter. It's uh, bandpass filter, so you can 
change frequency as you like. It's uh, basically LNA and RF amplifier and mixer. Mixer is here to uh, basically mixer. I'm sorry, I'm, I really am hangover a little bit. So, okay, what's the top right? So basically everything else from the thing I didn't uh, tell on last slide. I'm feeling here miserably. Uh, software part is basically a lot of algorithms and middleware. What that means is that uh, one hardware, for example, HackRF, uh, can be used to sniff Bluetooth, so you can, you, it could be used to sniff Zigbee, it could be used to sniff uh, Wi-Fi or similar stuff. And this is the really game-changing thing in our world now because we have one platform that can develop a lot of things, that we could develop a lot of things, and so with a couple hundred of dollars, you could hack a lot of things. In brief, a software radio is a radio system which performs the kind of single processing in software intended of using dedicated, the blah, 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 blah. Uh, I want to talk about Bluetooth. Uh, this is, uh, uh, on your left, this is the Bluetooth stack. It's a really simple explanation of Bluetooth stack in this picture. It's a lot a bit uh, complicated. Bluetooth low energy is not, uh, it's not Bluetooth, uh, it's not the uh, same as uh, Bluetooth, uh, for example, 2.1, which you normally have on your phones. Nowadays, phones are using Bluetooth low energy too. But uh, Bluetooth is on, uh, Bluetooth low energy is on top uh, is another protocol that could be implemented on on Bluetooth devices. And uh, if you have Bluetooth uh, sniffer, you probably uh, won't uh, won't sniff Bluetooth low energy with it. Uh, basically, uh, Bluetooth uh, is really simple GF GFSK. Uh, modulation, it has 40 channels uh, in 2.4 gigahertz, uh, gigahertz band. Uh, it's really hard to sniff, and we are finally getting to point. It's really hard to sniff because Bluetooth uh, is hopping, and that's the problem. And Ubertooth managed to, uh, to overcome that. They are great guys, Mike Cosson, maybe you follow his work. Uh, so basically, if you have uh, you have 40 channels, three of them are you uh, are for advertising, and 37 of them are for data. You can see a picture in below of my presentation. That's basically overlapping of uh, Wi-Fi channels one, six, and eleven in US uh, in US uh, frequencies, and. It's uh, most of the data are are overlapping with uh, that uh, frequencies, uh, but advertising channels are uh, purposely uh, made so it, it doesn't overlap with Wi-Fi protocols. So uh, that three channels are always uh, there and could be uh, and there is no interference. Basically, what does uh, how the process of Bluetooth and pairing with Bluetooth works is that uh, first initial thing is that the device is advertising in uh, in advertising channels, and the pairing process is done through the uh, through the advertising. And when initial things are implemented, like temporary key and stuff, then uh, then the data are transferring with uh, data channels. Uh, how the hopping works? Basically, uh, hopping works that uh, we are sniffing, uh, we are uh, sending data on one channel, and then we, for example, uh, hop to the seventh channel, and later on, on uh, we are uh, we are transferring, we are. Uh, we are agreed to do the second channel and so on, so on. It's always some mod of, of 37. So you always, that's, uh, when they made, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 
when they made uh, this protocol, they, uh, they made a mistake, unfortunately for them, uh, because we have uh, 40 channels and three of them are for advertising, uh, you get prime number 37 of data channels. And we, we are a little bit into security and we know that prime numbers are, are a little bit different. So uh, when, we are, uh, we, when data is transmitted, you always, uh, you always end up on exact same channel in one time and this thing will be used to hack Bluetooth and that's really shame for them. If they use 41 channel maybe we will have different different uh, and maybe a lot a bit harder Bluetooth sniffing. So let's uh, talk if some of you don't know about Ubertooth. Ubertooth 1 is my Cosmos uh, great project around, it came out around two, uh, 2010. Uh, it's basically game changing for Bluetooth sniffing because uh, you, uh, you, if you wanted to sniff Bluetooth in before this uh, device, you would probably need a lot, a lot of money and this thing only cost 100 bucks. Uh, it's a great thing. Uh, Ubertooth 1 is not really, uh, it's not really, uh, it's not really uh, RF front end. Uh, it has a lot of, a lot of, a lot of more implemented on it and uh, basically it's, uh, it's decrypting, uh, it's decrypting physical and link layer and it set packets directly to the from to the USB 2.0 uh, and to the PC of, or some other platform. Uh, so basically, uh, we have antenna, of course. We have two chips, uh, CC2591. Uh, that chip is basically the, the uh, I'm sorry I didn't explain that, but basically this chip is amplifier. First version of Ubertooth, Ubertooth Zero, didn't have this first chip, and uh, but you can sniff without it. It's not necessary, but you uh, you wouldn't uh, have uh, LNA, so you don't you couldn't uh, have uh, enough strength to sniff on uh, longer distances. And basically, this uh, CC2501 is uh, basically 2.4 gigahertz uh, LNA. So uh, this thing is important uh, because it's generic. So it, it could be potentially used to sniff other data. Uh, CC2400 is another chip on Ubertooth. It's, uh, it's, it's for GF. SK demodulator, and because uh, Ubertooth using uh, Bluetooth is using that demodulation, uh, it's only specific for Bluetooth and other protocols that they are using that demodulation. I researched a little bit about that, and I found out that CC2420 is uh, uh, it's basically same thing, but it could potentially uh, dec uh, the de de demodulate uh, the Zigbee protocol. So basically, if you dis disolder that chip and put uh, the another chip that could, you could make uh, Ubertooth one uh, de decrypt, uh, uh, decrypt, I'm sorry, uh, demodulate de the Zigbee signals. And de uh, I, I'm not sure uh, that's the project I will be working on in future, in next year. I, I, I potentially, you need a new firmware, so this will be interesting. Uh, basically, the uh, that part is uh, demo, uh, is about physical layer of Bluetooth, and you get uh, that's why we need a microprocessor to decrypt uh, the decrypt to work with. Uh, to work with physical layer of that, and we need a microprocessor to do with link layer. And uh, on, so we could get on USB, we could get packets. Uh, a little bit about, I didn't want to say a lot about this, but basically I need to. 
uh, you, uh, link layer is made of preamble, access address, uh, PDU, and CRC. Uh, we need access address for uh, sniffing Bluetooth because access address, uh, if we know access address, which is on top uh, on PDU, we could, uh, PDU is data that we are looking for. So when you have a lot of zeros and ones into the air, you need where something starts, where not. Uh, if you know access, ad uh, access address and you, you have uh, that part, you can tell uh, the CC240 to look for the data and basically everything else uh, that came from the data is PDU which are we are looking for. Uh, CRC is uh, it's big. Uh, it's hmm. CRC is uh, needed, but it's optional in Bluetooth sniffing. You could extract data with CR uh, you could uh, use CRC to of course uh, to drop uh, the wrong uh, to drop m packets that are not uh, that are not right so but basically you don't need it for uh, okay mm, so we basically uh, I talked about channel hopping and we need several things. We need hop in interval and hop in increment. That's uh, the two things in, uh, and how do we extract that. So we have, we have data that are transmitted with hopping sequence that we don't know and uh, there and we need to catch the data. So we uh, take Ubertooth and we sniff one channel and wh when one channel is sniffed, uh, the m when, because uh, 37 is prime number, you need to, you will end up in sending another data on that channel in some time frame. And if uh, you sniff long enough, and you sniff first data, and you later found out that it's uh, another, when time frame, uh, when again it's data transmitted on the channel you can you have a time frame that could be uh, your uh, you have time frame that uh, if you divided with 37 you get hop interval and you now know hop interval so you need to, to determine hop increment hopping, hopping, hopping increment is harder to to get, but it's basically a lot of thinking and people came out with this idea. So first thing you do is you sniff data on one channel and then you, for example, increment your ch uh, channel sniffing for one. Or if you sniff uh, channel zero and then you, uh, then you basically sniff the channel one, uh, you can determine with, uh, uh, when the date, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't have the. Okay, so basically, it's not that important. Uh, when you get data, you implement uh, the Wireshark thing. I'm, I'm sorry. I need to explain this and I'm really a little bit hangover and I really, I, my nervous kick out and I can't explain this and this, oof, okay. I'm sorry, I won't explain this. So basically, when you have COP interval and COP increment and access address, which is, which is uh, and you now uh, you need to uh, decrypt the uh, decrypt. Uh, you now need to uh, to other layers of uh, Bluetooth is easily uh, is easily uh, 
seen in Wireshark. Wireshark has Bluetooth Low Energy uh, stacks implemented in it. Uh, basically, you would uh, pipe through, through, you make uh, the pipe, I'm sorry for uh, Windows users, but this is really easy in Linux. So basically, you pipe the connection through to a, basically you sniff, uh, you enter this pipe into Wireshark and you can decrypt out all, all other layers into Bluetooth. And Wireshark, of course, is the easiest thing to, uh, most of us are using it for, to decrypt, uh, to, are using this for wireless sniffing, so it's really common thing to, to use in, in this area. Uh, a little bit about uh, pairing. Pairing. Uh, um, pairing is done with uh, uh, sniffing and decracking the Bluetooth is really easy in 4.0. 4.0 is first uh, first initial release of Bluetooth Online Energy. It's introduced in that. Area uh, it has several ways of pairing pairing uh, with just work, uh, pairing with out of band pairing and pass key. Uh, just work is uh, when temporary key is set to zero. Temporary key in uh, Bluetooth is used to make shorter key. Short term, -term key is uh, used to uh, do long term key, and long term key is used to. Uh, make session, session key which basically encrypt the PDU uh, and data. So if you have temporary key, uh, you can do that. If temporary key is zero, you have it, and you can, and there is no much of encryption uh, going on then. You can easily sniff. Out of band pairing is really the most, is really the most uh, secure way of pairing the Bluetooth devices, uh, but it's really uncommon in uh, embedded devices because you need a lot of external hardware and like NFC, or you will need another connection with uh, wireless and stuff like that. Uh, so basically out of band in Bluetooth low energy is not used. Uh, pa pass key is, is when you Passkey is uh, commonly used in Bluetooth low energy. It's more most likely that you find if you if you try to uh, hack the Bluetooth, most likely you will find the pa passkey encryption. So basically, uh, the devices are uh, making sure that uh, same passkey is used, uh, the t uh, same t temporary key is used. Temporary key is integer between zero and uh, one million, so it's it's easily brute forced. Uh, they are they are they are uh, they measured how long it's need to brute force this temporary key. It's around one second. So basically, you could offline sniff, and you don't need to you don't need to you don't need to do much of uh, processing words so you you can basically real time decrypt the data if uh, if you are snipping bluetooth uh, 4.2 are introducing new met pairing method numeric comparison numeric comparison it's not uh, really it's more secure where because uh, both devices need to have a display uh, and you need to enter the temporary key that they are uh, pass key. So uh, this is the secure way, but like I said, uh, embedded is like low cost thing. So you don't, uh, so you don't, uh, you don't find this in real world, in real world. Bluetooth uh, 4.0 is is um, is more uh, advanced thing to hack because it introduces elliptic curve uh, DH. Uh, basically, it's more advanced thing and it's harder to crack. Uh, so uh, you have mm, this is not. I'm sorry, there are several slides that are missing. Okay. 
you have two cases of this uh, sniffing data. So maybe the party started without you and they're, they are only transmitting on data channels. So you could easily uh, make sure that devices, uh, you could basically uh, have access address, CRC and channel hop interval. I explained how you uh, hop interval and hop in increment uh, and access address uh, is sniffed. So first of all, you, if you sniffed, you you have other case. If you want to have access address, you're looking for a way to find uh, if both devices are sometimes sending empty uh, packets. So they are aware that they are here, so they don't break connection. So you're actually looking, uh, now it's, uh, access address is used to find PDU in uh, Bluetooth sniffing, but now uh, it's, uh, it's another way to do that. It's you're looking for empty packets and everything that's in front of that is potentially access address. And you sniff a lot of data and then you have uh, then you have a potential, uh, several potential access address and trial and error thing and you this, uh, I'm sorry. So, I did, uh, I want to talk a lot about Bluetooth, more <laughs> things, but I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't make slides and I lost my concentration. Uh, Zigbee security. Overview. Uh, Zigbee is another protocol that is common use in IoT. It's It's probably more. Uh, it's probably more uh, about home, home automatization and stuff like that. And that's why it's important to, to be more secure. The problem with Zigbee is that it, it's not bad protocol. The, it's it has strong security. But the problem with Zigbee is that uh, it's not, when Zigbee specified, it's not really the matter that it's security is optional thing to, uh, for uh, vendors to implement. So a lot of vendors are, of course, uh, bearing security to minimum. And it's not the Zig Zigbee that the problem, implementation of Zigbee is the problem. And a lot of securities, uh, security flaws are, uh, uh, are introduced when you implement it wrong. Uh, the main problem with Zigbee is that people are using, for example, master key that's uh, potentially only distributed to vendors and vendors are using it, but the problem with that is that people are, of course, selfish and the master keys of, for example, the ZLL is no. Uh, Zigbee using different uh, modulation technique than Bluetooth. So, uh, so, uh, and different uh, hopping sequences. Uh, the problem with Zigbee is that it only has 16 channels and it only transmits on one channel. Difference between Zigbee and Bluetooth is that Zigbee uh, Zigbee Trust Center only scans the whole area of Zigbees uh, or for potential channel to uh, use for data sending, and it it's fixed. So you can easily sniff data on one channel. So basically, if you go to 4.2 gigahertz uh, signals, you will easily find one that is Zigbee on. Uh, for Z uh, Zigbee is, for example, uh, my example of impl bad implementation of uh, o point o uh, Zigbee is uh, basically a little s a simpler protocol than Bluetooth. It's uh, based on 0215.4.2 uh, 
for uh, I, 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 IEEE standard. And on top of that, you basically have network and application layer that is actually ZigBee specified. Uh, for one example of security flaws and security flaws that are optional uh, in uh, this uh, physical and MAC layer, security are turned off by default. So it's it matter of developer to implement, uh, to turn that off, on. So basically you have problem if you're developing and you're not aware of that and a lot of cases are introduced where this thing happened. Uh, Uh, ZigBee security is based on symmetric encryption and it's really okay. Uh, it has message authentication, integrity, integrity protection, that's another layer, and replay protection. Replay protection uh, basically increments each time when message is received, so you you don't, uh, you don't, uh, you cannot inject the message. But the problem with replay protection is that it, it could turn, uh, you could turn the off replay protection. Uh, integrity, uh, this is uh, how, the, how the protocol message looks like, uh, basically, M uh, is, uh, an, uh, mic is mic uh, is on top uh, is integrity protected. Everything in front of uh, mic is uh, checked again, so you cannot uh, you cannot uh, scramble the data or similar stuff. Uh, network key uh, basically Zigbee has two ty type of keys: network key and leak key. Uh, network key is distributed among all devices, and Linky is only established between two uh, devices. Uh, when the data are transmitted, uh, you need to make sure that, it, of course, is encrypted, but there are new uh, devices introduced into ZigBee network. Uh, it first send data that it's, it's here. So the uh, first thing Zigbee made uh, uh, made the mistake is the first thing they used is to send data with play, uh, they send the, the link key with uh, in plain text. Uh, that's the problem. But now they are using master key that's uh, in, implemented in in Trust Center. Trust Center is basically like a gateway in uh, like a router router in in wireless communication. So Trust Center has master key that use uh, and uses master key to encrypt other keys. The problem with that is that most of the master keys are you have two types of master keys. It's one that are default master keys, and of course it's uh, Zigbee specified, it's open. And of course, if you have master key, and you know it's in, you're using public master key, it's the same thing as you're sending the plain text, because key that you that you keep with is open. Another problem is that vendors uh, of Zigbee devices are using this technique that they're using that master key uh, and they are only distributed the master key with vendors. And that's, uh, th that's a problem because uh, every few or then there are, there are places when the, the key leaks. And of course, that's the same thing as you are sending in plain text. Uh, the day, okay, keys are, I'm talk about this. Uh, the main problem with uh, this is, uh, tools for sniffing, sniffing uh, Zigbee protocols, uh, the more expensive ones are USAP, uh, software defined radios they are pretty expensive for serbian standard it's around 700 bucks uh, but it's good because a lot of other uh, a lot of other protocols are 
sniffed with that tool, so basically maybe you want to invest in that. Uh, Kisby is uh, Kisby is made by, with, uh, by a guy who invented Kismet. Probably you heard of Kismet if you sniffed Wi-Fi a little bit. Uh, Kisby is basically hardware, hardware or firmware for that hardware. Uh, it's nice. Uh, it's really great tool. Uh, unfortunately, Kismet is uh, Kisby is on hold right now because uh, Kismet is developing on Android platform, so they are focusing on that. And that's really a shame because Kisby is potentially a great product. Uh, the mo more uh, cheaper version so because uh, of Zigbee sniffing is Texas Instrument uh, CC2531. Uh, it's uh, really low cost uh, hardware. You can get it on from Chinese uh, like AliExpress and stuff like that. It's around 10 bucks. It's really great thing. Uh, uh, and a uh, good point uh, for Windows, Windows users is that it has very nice uh, software uh, for that. It's Texas Instruments Smart RF uh, Packet Sniffer. It's, it's interesting software because it's really fun with colors and protocols are really uh, nice to sniff with that uh, Texas Instruments. I tried to uh, I tried but I failed to implement that uh, to wind it on on Linux machine, but I didn't make it. I'm unfortunately, that's probably possible. But I didn't couldn't do that. Uh, one another hardware is uh, uh, from Atmel. It, it has Killer B firmware on uh, it by pre predefined. Uh, you could get it cheap for fi 50 bucks uh, on eBay and stuff like that. But if uh, the Killer B is on top of is on it, on it uh, probably you will get charged around $100. Killer B is uh, uh, firmware for Atmel processors that is uh, that is used to uh, that is used to sense to to sniff uh, data on Zigbee and to send packets to the USB for example. It's really nice firmware. Uh, I want to talk about uh, LoRa a little bit. Uh, LoRa is uh, another IoT protocol. It's uh, basically modulation, uh, but they are made uh, LoRa one that is protocol on top of uh, physical layer that is LoRa, and uh, basically LoRa is used for long range communication. They advertise it so it could make 15 kilometers with it, uh, but the real range is around five kilometers, that's the uh, in open field and around probably one to, for, to two kilometers in urban areas. Uh, uh, basically it's uh, on 800, uh, in EU, EU, EU it's uh, 868 megahertz, in US it's 9. 15. It's open standard. Uh, it's open frequencies, and basically, LoRa use eight channels, and it hops between the channels. Uh, there are no uh, cheap alternative to sniff uh, LoRa uh, because uh, you have eight channels, and eight channels are expensive to make uh, that kind of hardware. So basically, a lot of people are implementing to sniff only one channel, but that's the problem with LoRa because LoRa pseudo randoms changing the channels on chips. So probably that's the problem. Uh, the, another problem with implementation of uh, LoRa. LoRa is, like I said, physical layer of LoRa One protocol. It's not a protocol by itself. So if you're you, uh, if you're not implementing LoRa One, you didn't uh, uh, implement the encryption at all. And most of people are using LoRa like LoRa because it's simpler to implement. It's uh, maybe only a few lines of code. But uh, the reality of that is that you're probably you're sh for sure sending data in plain text. Uh, LoRa, actually, my experience with with LoRa is really good. 
uh, he, I didn't uh, manage to, I had uh, multi-tech gateway, I didn't manage to break it. Basically every device uh, need, needed to be registered on the gateways and uh, you couldn't uh, basically uh, do anything on gateway side. Potentially what you could do is that you can extract uh, physically uh, information from chip uh, with probes, but last year it was talk about that, so I want uh, probability, for example, is that that you are impl if you are implemented uh, LoRa, basically, uh, if you ever use LoRa, you meet uh, the chip uh, or from mi uh, microchips uh, LoRa uh, chip uh, RN24. <coughs> <coughs> basically, you send MAC and three layers uh, commands to chip, and uh, most of implementation, real life implementation, in that you're uh, left uh, the new uh, the keys into, for example, a Raspberry Pi or stuff like that. You you don't need to re resend the keys to the chip. Chips stores that on itself. But most of the real life implementations is that most of people are uh, sending the data uh, when initializing initializing the chip on, for example, from st when chip is restarted. So they are extending the range that LoRa can be hacked, but not by sniffing it. Uh, Matt Knight, Matt Knight, uh, we have, Matt Knight uh, uh, tried to decrypt the physical layer. Uh, that project is on hold. Uh, we need to someone who will finish that project. Uh, it's one real, it's great thing that he, that he done, but we don't have physical uh, layer. Uh, it's gray, uh, it's, it's foggy area right now. So there are not a lot of uh, real life implementation of LoRa sniffing packets and stuff because we don't know protocol itself and that's the problem with that. Uh, so basically, LoRa has two types of joints, OTA and ABP. Uh, ABP, uh, ABP is a more secure way, but that's the type of uh, pairing that is uh, vendor vendor approved because they are they uh, they make the uh, the hardware that goes with. Uh, with gateways and that's the way only to send data. Real life implementation of joining is OTA join and you probably, if you do that, you join. Uh, if you joined with gateway, you use the OTA. Uh, basically, every uh, node has app, uh, need to have address, app key, uh, new, new key, uh, devious A, 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 AOE and uh, uh, message first initial message is uh, the always the problem. Uh, it's not encrypted, but it's signed with app key, and app key is only stored onto your device. And if you register a device on gateway, uh, it's really like you encrypted it, and there's no there's no places so you can you can uh, in inject or something like that. So I want to say a few keynotes about RFID garage doors and cars implementation so you could start thinking about it if, or, or start sniffing the data. RFID is basically break to probably most of you or your companies have RFID doors and stuff like that. Is basically the how the hacking works is that you steal RFID uh, or st still have RFID information by sniffing the data with Proxmark or similar similar uh, sniffing tools for RFID and basically RFID concept is that pro a lot of RFIDs could be could be uh, could be uh, Changed, so you change the, uh, your card with another with sniff cards ID, and you have you can access the uh, RFID drawers. Uh, 
the problem with RFID car sniffing is that you really need to be close to the RFID. And the, the couple of guys presented on Black Hat uh, two years ago, uh, the, the Arduino project that uh, extended the range of commercial, uh, uh, commercial RFID sniffing tools, uh, RFID tools. So basically if you have, uh, for example, HID or similar protocol, uh, RFID protocol hardware, you can implement it with, uh, you can extend that range with that Arduino and uh, you can stiff on thir two, 20 or 30 centimeters and that's really improvement because basically you can have a bag with that sniffer and you can easily pass by a person and sniff data from the card and you don't need to be in close proximity. Uh, first of sniffers are, are talk, uh, are first uh, version of sniffers are implemented like Proxmark. Pro Proxmark is really not, uh, is really cannot be used in real life because you need to be in really, really close proximity of RFID chip, uh, RFID uh, tag, and that's the problem with that. And they are advertised it so you could basically grab someone's butt or something like that to sniff data from the cards, and that's not really impossible. Uh, that's really impossible in, li in real life. You probably get sued or something like that. Uh, garage do doors are using are maybe older technology, and probably a lot of garage doors. Uh, are using some really simple protocols and maybe 10 or 15 bytes, uh, 10 bytes, for example. Uh, the, the thing that you can practice uh, garage doors hacking is that probably you need to break few uh, few garage doors uh, openers and stuff like that. You probably need to make sure you see what kind of thing in, is in there. Uh, there are a lot of data on internet. They probably, uh, they probably have information about modulation and stuff like that that is potentially you can do to sniff data. Uh, garage doors are also interesting because they can, the data can be sniffed with 10 bucks uh, front ends and potentially GNU radio or stuff, uh, similar stuff. Cards, of course, uh, Kir knows about cards. Uh, it's really, it's really a, a little bit complicated, but the first thing you need to have in mind is that cars are probably, if you unlock the car, the car will have some random number generated and they have uh, integrity protection in a way, so the pot, uh, they, if, you, if you press the car opener button, you, the car are but, uh, also agreeing with that key, so it increment key for one, and your key are also incremented uh, the key for one. So basically, you cannot, if you sniff data from car, you uh, from car uh, from locking the mechanism, you cannot use that key. And the pro uh, the problem so is to jam when you're jamming the signal. Uh, when you want to steal the car, probably you will jam the signal, and when person is not. Uh, uh, when it's second time when, and sniff the data, and when person is unlocking a an, uh, lock another time, you ha you will have that key, uh, but uh, you in you could potentially use it for later, and that would be that. I'm really sorry about this presentation. Uh, I wanted to talk about a little bit more. I didn't manage to transfer anything I know in this. Uh, area and I'm really sorry.